Hello, good morning and uh, or good day, good afternoon. Welcome to Discover Energy Work. Um, we're a podcast which is really about uh, people's development to, you know, uh, different areas of, of consciousness um, where they've developed some ability to either feel what other people are feeling or see into the future. We've talked to remote viewers. We've talked to um, or Jeffrey Mishlove, somebody who's like who's got a PhD in parapsychology. And today I, I feel very, very honoured and very special uh, to have Professor Stanley Krippner here. So good morning, Stanley. Good, good afternoon. morning. Very, very gracious. Thank you for the compliment. Yes. Stanley, it's uh, it's very interesting. I, I understand. Well, number one, um, you spent your life researching consciousness. And um, yeah, number one, I suppose I want to ask you, like, uh, in the field of parapsychology, which is something you've also worked on, ha have you felt like it's been career suicide to do something like this? you know, in the, in the world of where people, you know, poo-poo it. Well, to tell you the truth, I never thought that much about career suicide because from the beginning, I really never took myself that seriously. I am not a high achieving type of person. I was not really intent on pushing and furthering my career. I was more interested in satisfying my curiosity and doing things that I thought would be beneficial to my fellow human beings and to the world at large. I think that you're right. I think that I would have had a more remunerative, a more successful career had I gone in another direction. But that isn't the way things happen. And your your uh, assistant sent me a little bio, and, and immediately something um, came to came to my eyes, which which made me want to dig. Uh, in your bio, it says you had a childhood experience, a very special childhood experience um, that that made you think differently. Do you know what that's referring to? Yes, well, actually, I had several very seminal childhood experiences that charted the course of my life. The one that you're referring to occurred when I was about 10 years of age. I lived on a farm in Wisconsin, and I was an avid reader and would do a great deal of reading on a number of topics. And my aunt was selling what at that time was called the World Book Encyclopedia. And she was selling them for $100 a set, which of course was Whoa. exorbitant in those days. Now it would not be so much. But my parents were farmers. They were very poor. They could not afford the $100. I was very dejected. I went to my room crying, as a matter of fact. I thought, who do I know? who I can borrow $100 from. But I have one rich relative, and that is my Uncle Max. And then I thought, no, I cannot ask my Uncle Max because he's dead. Well, where did that strange notion come from? At that moment, there was a scream from downstairs. My mother had answered the phone. And yes, indeed, her brother-in-law, my uncle, my uncle Max, had just died of a heart attack. He was a fairly young man in good health as far as we knew, but uh, he was gone. And I was in such shock. I didn't tell anybody about that for a long period of time. But that's what got me interested in unusual experiences. And then I started to read about parapsychology and similar topics. Right. So you're reading at the age of, of 10 about these things. Well, back in those days, there were popular psychology columns in the newspapers. That was my first line of endeavor. And then as time went on, 
and I went into the university, I found out that there was actually the field of parapsychology that took these experiences seriously as a field of study. It was controversial at that time, of course it still is controversial all these decades later, but I began to take courses in addition to my mainstream courses that would satisfy my curiosity. Now I have a I have a question for you because I I've, I've um, got a personal interest in uh, obviously I've got a psychology degree and uh, I've got a personal interest in the uh, development of consciousness yeah and I feel that like we have um, I hope it's not too difficult for our audience but uh, Eric Erickson's psychosocial model of psychic development have you developed a, a model that explains how children very often get these psychic experiences is there such a model that parents could look to i have not developed such a model myself to be very frankly i'm not smart enough to develop a model but many of my colleagues have developed models that i think are very viable and very workable some of them make a model based on quantum physics. Some of them create models based on cognitive development. Some of them create models that are mathematical in nature. So there are plenty of models out there and they all deserve attention and consideration. And members of the Parapsychological Association get together from time to time and discuss not only research, but theoretical approaches to understanding these models. Now, of course, mainstream psychology rejects all of this. And they think it's a waste of time to concern ourselves with models and even the research on the field, because such experiences are in the face of it impossible. So parapsychologists still have an uphill battle and we do our best with a very small amount of money, very few resources, very little recognition, and we keep plugging away, and little by little, some pieces seem to be falling into place. I do want to ask you um, more about some of the early um, uh, like research that you've done, but can we stay on this topic for a moment? And um, I'm I'm curious about the similarities between psychopathology so abnormal psychology where we say somebody is sick and somebody having a, a psychic experience of another dimension well thank heavens this is something that has been researched pretty thoroughly and the research that's been done on parapsychological experiences and personality disorders tends to indicate that uh, they're really not that closely related. Yes, from time to time, there are people who are psychotic who claim to have psychic experiences, and indeed some of them do. However, most of the people with psychic experiences are mainstream. Some of them are even shall we say, more creative, more adventurous in their personality development and in their endeavors than people who do not have the experiences. There is also the concept of thick boundaries and thin boundaries. This is something that can be measured psychologically. And I and other people have found that when the boundary tests are administered, people who have psychic experiences, who at least claim to have psychic experiences, do have thinner boundaries. Now, thinner boundaries is not necessarily advantageous because people with thin boundaries have more nightmares, uh, they have more anxiety, more depression, but they also have more fun. They're more creative, they're more spontaneous. People who have thick boundaries might have very few psychic experiences, but they're very steady, they achieve more, they have more stable lifestyles. So it's not advantage 
to advantage one way or the other to be thick, thinner in the middle. However, the thin boundary people do tend to have or claim to have more psychic experiences. Fantastic. Um, well, that's that's great. I'd love to I'd love to try that test and and even publicize uh, that test on the boundaries. I think it would be very interesting. Um, so, what what was the first sort of thing that you did in the psychic world as as a as an academic study? What what was the first thing that drew you drew you in? Well, I began my graduate studies, I took an interest in dreams. And then once I had a chance to do some parapsychological research, I had an opportunity of working in a dream research laboratory in Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. And we had grant money that allowed me to focus on telepathy and clairvoyance and precognition in dreams. And over the course of 10 years, we actually came up with one monograph, one book, and 100 published studies in parapsychological journals, but also mainstream psychiatric and psychological journals. And those researchers hit a very direct paradigm. We would have a person come to the laboratory and get to know a member of our staff who was going to be the so-called sender. And then they would be separated. The so-called sender would choose a random number and this would direct the sender to a sealed envelope that they would take to a distant room. And then they would open the envelope and there would be a picture. And so they would spend much of the ongoing night focusing on the picture, trying to send the picture to the sleeping research participant. Now, the research participant was doing the same, but instead of sending, they were trying to receive. So to put it in very simple terms, one member of the team was trying to send something, one member was trying to receive something, and believe it or not, it worked out more often than not. And that led to our publication of all those dozens of articles. And I have to say that uh, our work does not stand by itself. Other people tried to do the same thing and they had a fair amount of success. We had a pretty good rate of replication comparable to replication studies in more conventional types of psychological studies. Recently, there was a survey of all of the dream psychic experiences, experiments done within a 50 year period of time. And the replication rate was very robust. And the chances of this being due to chance or coincidence were astronomically small. Uh, something like one out of 100,000 times. So if people come up and say, you can't repeat this, we say, you cannot repeat it every time. I wish we could, but it is repeated more often than not. And certainly very few things in psychology when you deal with human beings are predictable and repeatable all, all of the time. But our dream and psychic experiences studies certainly are in the right ballpark. I right, and I Yes. I think that's uh, that's already uh, fantastic that you can get a very uh, scientific approach, a scientific result, which says, yes, there is something really going on. There is something transpersonal about our psyche. Right. People who say that there is nothing going on simply have to read the reports, read the research literature. To give your listeners and viewers a specific example, to make this much more concrete for them. One night, we had somebody come into the laboratory. He had dinner with one of our psychologists they had never met before, but dinner gave them a chance to establish communication, some degree of rapport. Mm. And then the research participant went into the soundproof room. The psychologist 
again, threw the dice, came up with a number, picked up an envelope, went to a distant room, opened the envelope, and there was a painting called Both Members of the Club by Saul Bellow, a famous American artist, a boxing match. So what was happening in the dreams? In the dreams, our research participant, who was an artist who had no interest in boxing, had a dream about going to Madison Square Garden to buy tickets for a boxing match. And in Madison Square Garden, he saw a poster showing two men boxing each other. So this is a very direct correspondence between the picture and the dream. Not all of them, of course, are that direct, but I think that gives your listeners and your viewers a chance to understand the type of research that we were doing. Now, at the same time, other parapsychologists are doing very, very different types of research, all of it very worthwhile, and they were also piling up results that were statistically impressive. Right. Now, um, I suppose, I mean, it, it is brilliant to talk about these statistically impressive uh, results that you've got. What about for you, um, was there like um, the most impressive um, psych psychic research that you did? Because I was, I was watching that uh, show that you did with Jeffrey Mishlove, who was also a guest here, um, about Apport. And I was, wow, that's totally amazing. And I totally, for me, it's believable. Um, but was there something which is even more believable, more unbelievable than Apport? And uh, Apport is, for our listeners, when a, uh, an object appears from out of nowhere, which is something conjurers do, illusionists do. But, but you went and uh, studied that from a um, scientific point of view. Uh, did you just ask a question about airports? Um, I asked the question, what is the most amazing, what's the most amazing um, research you did? Well, an airport, which is a, what I thought you meant, is when something, a material object comes out of nowhere. And in Brazil, there is a remarkable man by the name of Amir Amadin, and he was the topic of our study some 20 years ago. And we would sit around a table, and whenever he said, I have the feeling that something's going to happen, we would measure his heartbeat rate, his blood pressure, and in the meantime, off in a different part of the city, one of our staff members had a magnetometer to measure the mag geomagnetic fields. All of this was necessary because we are not only interested in the airport, the appearance of these objects, we're interested in the conditions regarding the airport. Now, sometimes a ring would drop out of no place. Sometimes a stone would drop out of no place. Sometimes a um, semi-precious stone, like a piece of amethyst would drop out of no place. And then we would test him again. And whenever these airports appeared, there was a elevated heartbeat rate and an elevated geomagnetic disturbance in the atmosphere. So the airports actually correlated with something that could be measured. Now, we've published this in a dozen different publications and also the Brazilians put out a book about all of this. Mm. Nobody to date has really found any alternative explanation like sleight of hand. How would it be sleight of hand when we were observing him at all times and sometimes the airport would happen in a different room or even in a different building where we had some of our staff members posted. So you ask what the most remarkable experiment was and I would say that one and again, this is easy for people to read about because it's been published 
in the Journal of Scientific Exploration and other journals that have some degree of credibility. And again, we do not have uh, critics coming in to explain it in the other way. So there you have it. It's, uh, it's an amazing um, and interesting story. I think it's very compelling. Um, and I think it's fantastic you, that you did that research. It's, I'm very grateful that you did that research, um, that people can now say, yes, these, these things do happen. Um, did you do any research on spontaneous healing? No. Uh, the healing experiments is a very worthwhile type of experiment, and it has been done, it needs to be done, but you can't cover all of the bases. And yeah. I certainly yeah. know of some instances where some remarkable healings took place due to who knows what, placebo effect, some sort of energy exchange, who knows, but that's a whole other parapsychological field. And we cannot cover all the bases. So no, I've not done any research on healing. Right, so you're, uh, it's fair to say that your your research was, um, is it fair to say that your research was more like lab research in your, um, uh, you weren't going to, so often going to a medium and um, getting like, how does a medium work? How, or did you do any of that? I did one piece of research with a medium that I can tell you about very quickly. And this is not a professional medium. This is sort of somebody who found herself being a medium uh, accidentally. She began having dreams about servicemen who had been serving in Iraq and Afghanistan who were killed in the line of duty. And they gave her information about themselves, their battalion, their company, even sometimes their first or last name. And she would wake up and write them down. And then she would go to a friend of hers who was an army chaplain. And he knew all of these deceased soldiers. And over the course of a year, she gave me 10 dreams and in all 10 cases, we were, she was able to track down the identification of the deceased soldiers and get them recorded through her colleague, who as I say, was a chaplain. And then he was reassigned to Korea and so the dream stopped. Now, this has been published. I published this in two journals and so it's a matter of record. And again, nobody has come up with a challenge. Theoretically, you could say, well, the two of them were making this up and they were perpetuating a hoax on you. But these are people connected with the military to engage in a hoax and being a member of the military of the armed forces, this is taking too much of a chance. This is putting your career at risk. What mm. would be the motive of them doing this? And again, we don't have an alternative explanation that makes sense. I think the good news is that uh, these men were all fairly young at the time of their death. And they all said, you know, don't cry for us. Don't grieve us. We're having a good time on the other side. We're having our own adventures, we're developing ourselves spiritually. And so don't shed tears over us, we're doing just fine. So for whatever it's worth, this is the type of information we got. Now, of course, there are some religious fundamentalists who are saying, this is all demonic. This is the work of, of dark forces. Right. Well, this of course is a matter of judgment and all that I can say is go a little further and tell us again, what is the motive? What would be the motive of getting these people in trouble with their superiors if they were consorting 
with demonic forces. So you get involved in something like this, and you do get some very, very strange reactions from people. Yes, I can, I can imagine. So um, that brings us, uh, the segue is to, well, um, did you develop um, with your research an idea about what happens to consciousness when we leave the body or, you know, um, what happens after, either when we leave the body through this astral travel, you might have done some research into that, or what happens when we die? Well, of course, this is a topic that one group of parapsychologists is especially interested in, and they engage in what are called near-death experiences, uh, out-of-body experiences, uh, after-death communication, and sometimes the results of their studies are really quite remarkable because you talked about mediums, this is something that alleged mediums claim to be able to do, talking to people who have passed on. Here we're getting into some very controversial topics. And this is so controversial, many parapsychologists don't even touch this. But it's something of great interest, great importance to people who justifiably will want to know what happened to their loved ones who have passed on. In some cases, uh, people claim to have lived before, and these are reincarnation studies. And there are a small number of parapsychologists who specialize in what we call past life reports. Again, realize that this is extremely controversial. However, many of the studies of past life reports have appeared in psychiatric journals, mainstream psychiatric journals, and so they have been rigorous enough to uh, get published in legitimate journals, just like our studies at Maimonides have been published in mainstream journals. So if all of this were fraud or poor research, the mainstream journals who have referees looking at uh, each study very carefully would never have let this pass. Yeah, I, I, I feel that um, mainstream society is just not ready to take on certain values that it would need to take on um, and changes in, in society uh, to accept the fact that psychic uh, phenomena is a real thing. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I feel like uh, as a researcher, I imagine you're always on the back foot. Good point, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, I, I'm fascinated myself, and um, how does somebody who wants to go and research or wants to get, wants to maybe do a master's or, or further the study of uh, um, paranormal paras parapsychology, how do they, how do they approach this? Because I, if I if I search a degree online on parapsychology, I find nothing. Well, I tell people if you want to get something done in this field, you have to realize that there are very very few full time positions available. So what you need to do is to get a master's or a PhD in some mainstream psychological topic. Like my PhD was in counseling and guidance. So I have a opportunity to make a living and have a career, even if the parapsychological uh, funding has dried up. Some people have gotten their PhDs in physics and mathematics even in psychology, psychiatry, and sometimes in library science. And yet they do find time and effort to do very legitimate parapsychological research. The Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia is an example. They have a grant that enables them to hire 
two full-time people who do nothing with their work but investigate past life reports. So those are plum jobs. And these people are very, very lucky because they can do their research and it's very, very good and solid research without having to worry about having their bills paid. Also, the Institute of Nordic Sciences right here in California has two or three full-time people doing research. And again, this is thanks to uh, money that was accumulated over the years by the astronaut Edgar Mitchell and his colleagues. So these people are assured of making a living and they can devote themselves full-time to parapsychological research. And this means that they can do one study and then another study that builds upon the other study and can keep on going without worrying about uh, having their bills paid. So of course, this is ideal. In Europe, there are some universities, mainly in Germany and in England and in Scotland, which have positions, teaching positions, which enable the professors to do parapsychological research with their students. Also, I should mention one in Sweden also. Uh, the situation in Europe is a little better than in the United States. So on the whole, there are perhaps a couple of dozen people at most who are working full time in parapsychology. Not very many for such a complicated field, but better than nothing. That's that's great, and and um, that, I think that's great advice to to get some some um, basic grounding uh, in something that pays the bills. I would actually like to ask you because uh, we've talked to a young lady who was on the verge of suicide uh, because of the psychic phenomena that she was experiencing, and I think a lot of parents sometimes can feel quite overwhelmed. So how do you as a counselor, is there, is there any kind of guidance you can give um, uh, to parents uh, who have a, a child who is psychic your, with your knowledge as a, as a counselor? My advice to those parents is to be patient and to listen. To just listen to the child's experience and not make a judgment and maybe tell them to draw a picture of it or write it up or to do something with it without censure. And this is much preferable than what some parents do is, oh, don't tell other people this, they'll think you're crazy. Or I never want to hear you talk about that again. I know one case where a young girl was occasionally having out of body experiences. And her parents were not very happy about this, but uh, didn't make an issue of it until on one occasion, several miles away, there was a fire, a house was being burned down and the parents ran off to the house and the daughter wanted to come and say, oh, no, no, no. You don't want to go there, it'll be too risky. There'll be people uh, maybe sick or injured. So what the girl did was to take an out of body experience. And she stood there right by her parents, watching the whole thing unfold. The parents came back. And the girl told her parents what had happened. And the parents you disobeyed us, you sneaked away and got there. And they spanked her. And that young woman never had an out of body experience again. So this is an instance where the parents were not patient. They did not listen. They made a judgment call, which unfortunately had negative consequences. Right, and um, do, we, uh, do we have any research um, which suggests that psychics who have been um, forced to suppress their psychic abilities, that that has um, some I say consequences for their, you know, for their lives. Well, once again, this is certainly a field that uh, needs to be investigated. 
This is a long-term project. Parapsychologists don't have the type of money to do what is required to answer your question. This would be a very valuable study, of course. There are studies where people are studying children with other types of experiences, and they follow the children 5, 10, even 15 years to see what happens over the course of time. Well, this is a type of study that needs to be done with parapsychological experiences. I don't think that it's going to happen, at least not in the near future. But all the questions you're answering could be answered if parapsychologists had the resources and the money to invest in giving them an answer. The way it is, the few parapsychologists who are around have to take a look at their resources and figure out where can I get the most bang for the buck and then invest their time and efforts that way. Right. I, I, feel, I feel it. I feel it. I feel certainly that there's, um, um, there's a big opportunity there. I do feel there's a big opportunity there. Um, counseling psychic kids, it's something that, that um, counseling psychic kids, I feel, is, is a big opportunity, uh, especially now that the world has got smaller through the internet. Yes, that's true, sure. Hmm. Sir, I am very, very grateful for your time. What um, if somebody's having a psychic experience themselves and they are being poo-pooed by their by their I don't know their environment? Do you have any advice for them? Well, my advice to mainstream scientists is simply don't rush for judgment. Be open-minded. I'm in no rush to push anybody to believe one thing or another. But if one simply refrains from making a judgment call and is open-minded, that's as much as we can hope. I would say that most of the reports that we have from children and from adults do have ordinary explanations. Very few of them are actually parapsychological in nature. But because they have ordinary explanations, doesn't mean we cannot learn something in the meantime from them. And we can learn about imagination, we can learn about coincidence, we can learn about subliminal perception, we can learn about placebo effects. So even when a so-called psychic experience has an ordinary explanation, there's something valuable that we can learn from that experience. Right. I suppose I have one final question that's just dropped into my mind is since you were nine, 10 years old, did you have any other major psychic uh, insights in your life that, that are worth mentioning to us? Well, really nothing that dramatic. I have had some what we call synchronicities, some right. dreams that came true, and some coincidences involving people I know. And again, those could have been coincidences, they could have been chance. But I'm not one of these people that has frequent psychic experiences. Right. I suppose the most dramatic experience that I can tell you about would be when I participated in an experiment with psilocybin, the psychedelic chemical, back in the early 1960s. Now, of course, psilocybin is mainstream. It's being used in psychotherapy with very, very positive results. Back in those days, it was an experimental uh, drug. And in my psilocybin experience, I actually had the image of President Kennedy being shot. And, of course, this was months before he was actually assassinated. Fortunately, I did write it down. I did distribute the experience, the report, to several people so that if the tragedy had happened, and unfortunately it did happen, they would have it on record. So that was probably my most dramatic experience 
since the death of my uncle back when I was nine or 10 years of age. Right, quite, quite amazing. And, and of course, we, um, I think that that brings us into a whole area uh, which is like the research of shamans and shamanic uh, ritual in taking these, uh, you know, magical, um, psychoactive, um, you know, uh, food or, or um, substances. Um, but I think we're going to have to leave that for another time. Um, Professor Stanley Kripner, I'd lo I would love to hear the, the, the hundreds of people applaud you throughout the world. Um, and throughout time, when they uh, see this uh, podcast, uh, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you so much for making time for me. And I would recommend to your readers, go to the website of the Parapsychological Association, and you will find articles by myself, books by myself and other people, and a lot of questions will be answered on the website. So there are resources available if people want to do a more diligent ex exploration of this topic. Great. I will, I will put a link in the notes of the show and the podcast. Also, I would suggest they go to the website of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And there they can learn about not only our experiments, but other people's experiments with parapsychological type dreams. So the resources are there if people want to look at them. Brilliant. Thank you very much. You're so welcome. Thank you for your good questions. <laughs>